this was something that I either wanted to do it privately and alone. I mean, I was a slave to this stuff. It, it ruined my life. It ran my life. Hey friends, my name is Pej. I'm an interventionist. I help people with drug addiction, alcoholism, and mental health. Today we're going to talk about methamphetamine again. More tales of methamphetamine, the adventures that come with it, the mentality, the outlook of life, the dependency, the reasons for even doing it. Um, you know, I, I love to speak on this topic because I have extensive experience, not just with being a former meth user, which now I'm 16 plus years sober, but also because I get to see it now from a different lens. Like I get to try to help people that are suffering from meth addiction and, and I know where their head's at because I've been there. Like I, I, I've experienced many different episodes as a result of being on meth or, or things that I would formulate or plans that I would make or projects that I would try to start but never finish. I will, you know, I'll talk about first of all why I even got into meth in the first place. So I was already um, at a very young age in my adolescent period um, experimenting with many different types of substances. Um, meth was definitely not on my radar. I was more into, well, you know, the typical marijuana and alcohol. That's usually what kids start with and I was into those things. But, you know, after hallucinogens, I did my, I had my little hallucinogen um, era. Um, I was introduced to cocaine and so cocaine is a stimulant and um, when we would do it, uh, sometimes we would do it to go out and party, you know, and, and clubs or things like that. And it would go hand in hand with alcohol, definitely. But I remember one time somebody happened to have some crystal meth, which was, they called it crank during that time. When I did it, I actually didn't even like it at all. I thought it was a little too powerful. Um, it made my heart race much faster, made me sweat. I wasn't at ease, right? As opposed to Coke, which I really thought I had under control. So the first time I tried it, I was not into it. Didn't want to have anything to do with it. But then what happened was as I got a little bit older and I was doing steroids and I was, um, you know, putting on a lot of muscle mass, because of getting off of a cycle of steroids, I remember I would eat a lot of food and smoke a lot of marijuana. And, and by doing that, I started to gain weight. And I noticed that there was a lot of other people in town that were getting into meth during that time and they were losing a ton of weight. A lot of them looked sucked up, uh, very, very skinny. Uh, a lot of the women around too in our circle of friends. Now, when I saw that, I thought to myself, you know, I started asking questions. They said, yeah, when you, when you do meth, you lose weight. Like you don't eat, you don't think about eating, you don't sleep, you're up for days and days. and it's definitely a, a great way to shed some pounds. So my initial reason for even doing meth in the first place, again, was to lose some weight. Now when I would do it, I also, obviously it would make me go into different realms of my mind. I tried all of these other different types of substances and each one of them gave me different answers. Marijuana makes you feel a certain way, it gets you stoned, it gets you high. Alcohol makes you feel a certain way, you can get drunk, you can get buzzed, um, happy-go-lucky. Hallucinogens, you go on a different path in your mind. You're basically going to different realms of your mind and everything's pattern-like or you can see things melt or, you you know, everything's a journey. But when we got into Coke, Coke was something that could keep us up all night long and we could drink longer. Um, you know, we would do alcohol and cocaine and the two would complement each other. Um, but when I got into meth, it was a whole different animal. This was something that I either wanted to do it privately and alone so I could because my mind was going 100 miles an hour but I either wanted to do it alone so that I could be with myself for many different reasons right and um, or I'd want to be around people that do it too so that we could share stories talk forever compare notes do all different types of you know drug talk and and so and then also what also comes with meth is that usually when you hang out with other people which we would call tweakers or meth heads we didn't trust each other like it definitely nobody trusted each other everybody thought that the other one is trying to get one over on them and and sometimes they truly were i believe that you know so many different emotions and feelings can come with with meth addiction for me personally there was a lot of paranoia um i always was looking over my shoulder because i thought that either the police are coming after me or somebody's trying to rob me jack me for money or for my drugs um i would always I had this mentality where I, 
I thought that I was productive, that I was getting a lot done, but really I wasn't getting anything done. Um, I'd start a lot of projects, but they were always usually unfinished. And whenever I would be tweaking really hard and going between all these things, I would always think, well, I'll get to that later. Oh, you know what? I'll work on this. And then, you know, ADHD, ADD would definitely kick in a lot. It was like intensified. And so it became a way of life. Now, I do know that often if I was on it for days and days, the, the come down was really, really hard on me. I didn't know how to manage my emotions. I'd be super tired. I, I knew that even though I could continue to keep doing meth and stay up for more days, there's going to be a crash period. Like I need, my body needs to rest. And so I would do that. Like sometimes I would, after three, four, five, six, seven days of being up, which truly like we were up for, for many days, sometimes up to a week and a half, um, where we were in autopilot, I would often just somehow crash. And when I would crash, it was a really, really heavy, hard sleep. And sometimes that, that a period of time of sleeping could be 24 hours. It could be 36 hours. I might get up once or twice to use the restroom or to eat something because I needed to replenish myself. My body needed to replenish itself. But then, you know, I would, the moment I would be well slept and on the other end of that, I was right back to doing it again. And I got to call somebody, find somebody, get some more and, and do some more. And that, that was just a way of life. You know, when you, when you do it for a long time, your life also, it seems like your life is constantly moving faster, right? They call it speed, so it speeds up your life. And in reality, what was happening was um, I was realizing that my life is going nowhere, but I don't know how to get away from this stuff. The people I had surrounded myself around were all caught up in that world too. And it was just what we were doing. And so when I was doing it, uh, I often would suffer. Like I knew that I was a slave to this stuff. If I'd been up for too many days and I'd be driving behind the wheel, I would often uh, grip the steering wheel, scream at the top of my lungs and just scream at the world. I hate everything. I hate the world. I hate everybody. You know, I hate myself. And truth be told, like I was my own worst enemy. It seemed like the demons were pretty much running the show. And, and that's the way it was for a long time. So, you know, when I finally got to a point I did quit for a while. Like I remember getting to the age of like 22, 23 years old maybe and stopping. Like I was so tired of doing that particular substance, but I continued to do other substances, which there was no recovery on the road, like ahead. I didn't know anything about recovery at the time. So I thought that meth was my problem. I can't do that drug, but I can still smoke weed and drink and do ecstasy and all these other drugs too. Finally, when I got to the age of 27, somebody again turned me on to meth and I got back into it. When I got back into it, it was like a more potent form. At this point, it was ice, it was uh, smokable. It was some, and there was a time when I was absolutely convinced I would never smoke this stuff, but I started smoking it and um, I was instantly addicted again. And it was like a three-way road. I had gotten involved with a woman who was into that stuff. She was new to it and I was, I already had experience with it, so I thought to myself, um, you know, this this doesn't look good. I already told myself before I don't want to do this. It's been a few years since I did it, but now that I'm with her, I'm either going to dabble a little bit and quit, or I'm going to quit and help her quit too, because don't you know codependency goes hand in hand with an addict like me, or I will, um, if I can't beat her, I just join her, and you know, I chose the, the third choice. And that, that lifestyle went on from pretty much the time I was 27 till the day that I did get sober, which was at 35, almost 36 years old. And I mean, I was a slave to this stuff. It, it ruined my life. It ran my life. It ended me up um, incarcerated, jails, institutions, many near-death experiences. Um, you know, when you're, when you're up for days and days, you become pretty erratic and and um, you don't act like normal human beings. So there was car chases, there was um, robberies, there was things that I would, got caught up in that I would never have imagined that I would do. But when you're in that mindset, especially that, that addict, that meth mindset, you have no mercy. You don't care who you, you screw over. You don't care, you, don't, you really have no true friends because you're not your own true friend, right? So it did become my demise. It brought me to my knees. And finally, I ended up uh, getting sober, and that was in my mid-30s. I ended up going to treatment. Um, when I first went into treatment, I thought that I was just addressing the meth issue. Again, I thought meth was my problem, but I realized shortly after that my issue is not 
any substance, although I did a lot of substances, the substance were nothing but a symptom. My issue was me. I'm the decision maker. I'm the person that's got the trauma. I'm the one that's got all of these issues. And so I ended up uh, working through that stuff and coming to this decision that I don't want to do any more substances. Now, when I started working in the field of addiction, not just as an interventionist, but did a lot of drug and alcohol counseling and things like that, I would often meet various people that had various addictions. So you get the opiate user or the alcoholic. Um, that's a certain type of conversation when I would try to work with those people. But when it came to people that were addicted to meth, they spoke my language. I did the other drugs too, but like this one, with this particular drug, they really, really spoke my language. And so, um, and I spoke their language too. I, I get them. You know, I understand what the mentality is that goes behind that. The paranoia. It's it, there's a lot of psychology behind it. Like a lot of it has to do with um, people that live a secretive lifestyle that are hiding something. And so when they're hiding something, they're using this drug that's keeping them up for so long that they're sleep deprived. They're malnourished, and on top of that, they have a world of secrets that they don't want anyone to find out. So they will pretty much constantly think that people are out to get them. People are watching them. People are spying on them. There's, I mean, there's so many stories, so many stories, and I'll make other videos about those stories. But, um, but in reality, you know, like uh, what really trips me out now is the fact that meth is at an all-time high. It's being used everywhere, all throughout our nation. I get so many calls from women or men that tell me that their loved one, their husband, their wife, their girlfriend, their boyfriend, their brother, their sister is not just on meth, but in full-blown psychosis. And how do you get through to somebody like that? Like, how do you actually get them to understand that this isn't real? Like, what they're, the, the voices that they're hearing, the drug-induced psychosis that is just expanding within their minds isn't real. I do believe that people can get better. I've seen lots of miracles. I've done interventions on people in full-blown psychosis that when you actually get them to have some kind of realization, where they can differentiate the truth from the false eventually. And that comes with a lot of intervening, a lot of conversations. Finally, they get to a point where they can not only get sober, but you know, stay the long haul, the long run. Like they basically get sober, the paranoia goes away after a while, the psychosis can go away after a while. I have seen some people that have done so much damage to themselves, especially the ones that were shooting meth, that the psychosis sometimes will either linger for a long period of time, or sometimes it doesn't go away. Like I, I, I have a gentleman that I've known for a bunch of years. He kept relapsing, he kept uh, slamming uh, meth, and now every so often he will just walk around and, and talk and scream at the voices, scream at the top of his lungs. And um, you know, I, I believe eventually, hopefully over a period of time, he might be able to stabilize but it's been a good year now, almost a good year, that I've seen him battle just that within itself. The psychosis that has come to him as almost like permanent damage as a result of doing so much meth. Now, if you know somebody who's struggling with meth addiction, by all means, you can always reach out to me. Um, we can have a conversation. We can maybe arrange something to where I could talk to the individual. Um, obviously, it's always better if I'm there in person. 310-596-9356 um, is the way to get a hold of me and then you know we can try to figure something out and helping your loved one and if they're if you're just suffering and you don't know what to do and they seem like there's no hope for them then at least let's help you be able to not have to suffer too. My name is Pesh.